Welkom bij Gitaarmannen de podcast. Mijn naam is Ed Struilaert. Op mijn negende zag ik Eric Clapton op tv. Ik wist het meteen. Dit is het. De gitaar zou vanaf dat moment mijn leven beheersen. In deze podcastserie praat ik met mijn favoriete Nederlandse gitaristen. Wat was het moment waarop zij vielen voor het magische stuk hout? En heeft de gitaar hun leven echt veranderd? Vandaag praat ik met James Morrison. Je luistert naar Gitaarmannen, de podcast. Yes, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Ed Struilaert. Uh, I'm the host of this podcast. It's called Gitaarmannen, the podcast. Uh, normally in Dutch, but today my guest is from the UK. So I thought, why don't I give it a try in English? <laughs> <laughs> so for all the new viewers, yes, this podcast is also on YouTube. And listeners, a warm welcome. Uh, in this podcast, I talk to my favorite musicians from all around the world with a guitar as an excuse to talk uh, about life and music. Uh, if you would like to support the podcast, please go to this address. There it is, petje.af slash Ed um, And decide if, it were, if it's worth something to you, all good. Um, okay, let's get the show on the road and let me introduce my guest to you. James Morrison was born in 1984 in Rugby, England. He first discovered guitar when his uncle Joe taught him how to play a blues riff. And in 2006, James was catapulted into the music scene with his worldwide hit, You Give Me Something. Here in Holland, it reached the second place in the charts, only to be beaten by this song by Marco Borsato and Lucy Silvers. Releasing massive songs in the years to follow, it now is time for his greatest hits album, which will see the light of day on February 11th. Time to talk about his career and his love for the guitar. Ladies and gentlemen, Today's guest in Guitar Man of the Podcast, James Morrison. James, <laughs> welcome. Thanks to, for uh, having me. Yeah, welcome, Thank you man. Guys. Um, first of all, how are you doing? Um, how, how is how is COVID in England at the moment? It's, it's actually not too bad. I think it's calmed down quite a bit now, um, which is good because it means gigs are starting to happen again. So yeah, it's it's good. I think it's, it's starting to feel like it's coming back to normal a little bit. Ah, that's great. But it's been so hectic. I think everyone's struggled with this because of the freedom thing, you know. I think we we were in a little bubble before um, and it sort of opened our eyes to like how how much freedom we had and and and, and, and how we didn't really use it properly. Yeah. Um, so I think it's been a good lesson for me. Hmm. It's been a massive lesson for me in terms of appreciating uh, what it is that I do for a living. And how good it is when it is good. Um, yeah, because you normally you don't you, you're sort of on a treadmill with it. Yeah. Uh, and so only it's only when you come off that you realize how good it is. Uh, and that's kind of what happened to me. I just felt like um, I was a bit sort of non you know, nonchalant about everything. Hmm. And then when it all got taken away from me, I realized how much I love it. Um, yeah. So that was a nice thing, actually. It and really what good. was like the the the, the lessons the, the lessons you learned are are pretty clear, and and, and I think we all <laughs> uh, are are like really like a little bit more humble, maybe about yeah. the thing we do for a living. Um, yeah. But also, how did you fill the time? I I put this studio together, my ah. little studio. Um, Show us around. Yeah, it's my sh home studio. My little drum kit, oh, nice. <laughs> all my guitars. Yeah, so it's just like uh, I, I didn't. I, I was wanting to do loads of writing sessions, and so uh, to be able to do it, I had to set my studio up at home. Uh, and actually, it was a really good thing. It just it allowed me to sort of create my own space to write in, and I had quite a few sessions up here, and, yeah. and it was nice. I wrote I wrote the um, first single off off this album mm -hmm. in this studio, so it was a nice way to sort of feel like. I can make music in my house. Yeah. You don't um, have to rent all the expensive, time, yeah. expensive studios anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the first time I've done it. So it was, it was, it's, it's been good. It's been good to have my own space. Definitely. Liberating maybe. Yeah. hundred percent. I should have done it a lot, a long time ago. Really. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just allowed me to sort of uh, develop myself as an artist. I've never really had the space to do that. Was that because, uh, well, a couple of I don't know how, how many years have you been on the on the scene I was now? a slacker I'm a slacker I should have got a studio when I was <laughs> yeah. 21 but when that's, the, the, that's the reality of it is that I should have got a studio when I was 21 but because I was brought up so poor hmm. I don't know I panicked yeah in the beginning that 
if I spent all my money on a studio and, and it didn't go well, then it wouldn't justify me, you know, having a studio. And I just didn't feel like I was that good. Yeah, to have a studio. And it's also because uh, record companies pay for the studios. It's like, yeah, well, yeah, that's it. And I didn't really understand any of that part of it. You know, it mm. took me a long time to get my head around how the business actually works. Yeah. Um, and so now I've figured all that out a little bit. Uh, it's. It, I'm trying to be more independent, as is much that, as, as more independent as I can be. Really, is that also the reason you re-recorded like uh, 13 of the 15 songs on on the Greatest Hits album? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I think. Yeah. I think for me, I wanted to get excited about it, and the only way I get excited about putting out a Greatest Hits is if I re-recorded those songs, just because I've had to listen to them for probably. 15 years. So, yeah. you know, well, to, to go back in and feel excited, I had to do something new. Um, and and that, and that, and then by doing that, it, it made me feel like I was giving the fans something worthwhile, you know, mm. something new to listen to. So, so it's not just a list of songs that you've heard for years. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it was good because it allowed me to sort of try and get rid of the things that have bugged me about some of them songs for, 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 for a few years. You know, some of it's just simple stuff like tempos or, mm. or there's too much production in some of the tracks. So it was nice, a nice experience for me to go in and sort of mess around with songs I wrote when I was 21 yeah. and have a bit of a hindsight into what, what I've been through and where I've, what, what I've, you know, what I've gone through to get to this point. So it was a nice nostalgic trip. Mm. For me, as an artist, you know, uh, so I think if people like my music, they're going to listen to this album and it it will be nostalgic, but also there's something new to listen to. So it's not like uh, you have to listen to the same tunes you've heard for yeah. 50. And do you run your own label nowadays? Not yet. Not yet. Um, but that is definitely something that I'm interested in. Um, yeah, that would 100%. be... Would be would have been smart if you like re-record all the songs. You get the master rights for one hundred percent, man. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I know. That's, that's it. where I'm the money is. To, I'm definitely working <laughs> yeah. towards that. I think it's definitely something I'm I'm, yeah. I'm I'm I've got in my peripherals, definitely. Uh, but at the minute, I'm quite happy to sort of be um, going to small little labels and then help me put my album out. It's just it's a lot of work for one person. I don't think I know enough about it yet. Yeah. to execute it properly. But um, I've definitely got it in my head that I'm going to do that at some point. Hey, and was there like one or maybe two songs that really came to life for you when uh, when comparing it to the original recording? I mean, I think a lot of them uh, sound better and different. Um, but but I said uh, the main few that sort of were tricky One was up, actually. Yeah. Um, the song I did with Jesse J. Mm -hmm. We I re-recorded it and I sang it on my own just because when I first wrote it, it was about it was about my dad. It was quite a personal song, um, and that's actually sounded like more rocky. Yeah. It sounds more like like I wouldn't say Led Zepp, yeah. but it definitely sounds more rocking than it did before, which is good. I think it needed that. And then the Precious Love is is way more gospely than it used to be, and a bit more like a soul band playing yeah. it. Um, and same with even like songs that people know, like You Give Me Something. Uh, sounds more soulful, more 70s soul, sort of. I don't know. It just sounds more in the pocket and yeah. more sort of like I'm owning the space. Yeah, but you, you've, lived in this, sort of, you've lived in these songs for like, Years and years, so yeah, yeah. So I wanted to sort of reflect that in the performance. I wanted yeah. to sort of just be in the spot on the mic, singing the best I can sing, and trying to do live takes and just get the vibe in the track, so that it's there when whatever you put on top of it is just going to add to what's already there. Yeah, um, and I'm lucky that my live band have been on tour with me for a while, so it was quite a natural feeling to go into the studio with my band and figure out how we were going to do these songs. Yeah. And it was more just about the lyric, trying to concentrate on the lyric, the melody, and, and trying to put in as little as possible, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't want to overcrowd it with, like, loads of production, loads of horns, strings, BVs. Um, so I just tried to dress it up in the most simple way I could, which was just my BVs, little sprinkling of girl BVs if it needs yeah. it, and no horns, no strings. 
just, just you're the, the band, band in the yeah. room being tight and that and i just wanted I, I wanted that i wanted that and what studio did you uh record it uh it was recorded in uh metropolis ah metropolis yeah. metropolis studios in chiswick uh, i used to live right around the corner from it actually um so it's quite funny going there it reminds me of when i was 21 and i just moved to chiswick and i thought i'd made it i had a real nice flat uh, and I, I did put out my first album, yeah. And and but it's a lovely studio. There's so many albums that have been made there. Um, but I've been there a few times over the years, so it was quite humbling to sort of go back there and just have the main room down the bottom. Yeah. That I've heard so many bands playing, from the Stones to the Stereophonics to there's so many people that have been in that room. Legendary uh, studio, yeah. Yeah. But equally, it's just a studio. You know, you only get the vibe what you take in, you yeah. know. So I'm lucky that I had some really good musicians who played with me for years that got what I was trying to do um, and, and and allowed it to happen. Cool. How long have you been, been playing with, with your, your band? Um, probably best part, like over, like most of them have been around for like more than about seven to eight years, even okay. longer, 10 years. Yeah. Maybe 12 years. Wow. 12 years, some of them. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I just like, I just collect players. You know, if I if I find someone who I really like their playing and, and they're easy to hang with, then they get the job. Yeah. And, and if they keep doing that, then I'll have them back, you know, until I find someone who's really good again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I to, I'm quite loyal. I'd rather yeah. be loyal than sort of cutthroat. Yeah, um, but yeah, the play. I'm lucky that the players all bring something to the game that makes it to go up another level. So I'm it's lucky. always a difficult thing. I, I know the struggle with with like hiring musicians in for your live band. It's like, do I get like the best player, but he's an asshole, you know, <laughs> or, or do I get people who are great and maybe yeah. when all the people come together, it's like. The, the sum is more than... Uh, yeah, than all the parts. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. And that's kind of what I feel like about my band. Like, even just my keyboard player on his own is astounding. Yeah. He, he's just one of the best keyboard players I've ever heard. He's like, he's a jazz pianist and he, and he can play guitar and he can sing. But, you know, that's just one player. Even the drummer, you know, Neil, he's played with Van Morrison. He's, wow. he's done a lot of all the X Factor stuff. So he, he knows his shit, you know, he knows what he's doing. Yeah, yeah. I'm lucky because we were on tour for a while. So um, I just, yeah, like I said, I, was collect, I just collect them, collect them over the years. If they're yeah. good and they're a good hang and they play well and they're, and, and they sort of, um, they get it. I think it's like, we're all, we're all doing the job. And then, and I always put the job first. Yeah. Uh, and then the laugh second. Hmm, yeah. You know, um, even though I love having a crack with a band, I love it. It's one of my favorite things. The job needs to be good first. So yeah, I, they only all get the job because they're really good and um, they bring something to the table. Yeah, I understand. I must say I've missed playing with my band in the last two years. Yeah. Really ready for it. For your new uh, Graves Hits album, you've uh, written two new, brand new songs, Who's Gonna Love Me Now and Don't Mess With Love. Um, how does your songwriting process look like? How, how did these two songs came about? I wrote them both in lockdown. Um, there was nothing else going on. So it was quite straightforward for me, really, just to keep writing, keep busy. Um, and I was lucky that there was a few different people who wanted to work with me and I'd set up my home studio. So they came here and we, yeah, I just, I just treated it like a few days. Let's have some fun, see what I can come up with. Uh, and the first one was more like I, my, I've got a friend who loves drum and bass and he loves dance music. Oh, yeah. And he was like, why don't you write a tune that's got a drop in it? Uh, and I was a bit like, well, I'm not really a dance artist. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, but you should. And so I just thought, all right. So I tried to sort of think about that. And yeah. I just sort of went in with the idea that we were going to do something with a drop. And I, I was lucky that the two guys I was working with had a similar feeling. Yeah. Uh, and so we just came in and it literally wrote itself. It just sort of wrote itself. It's one of those where we knew what we wanted to get out of it and we knew what we had to sort of say. And it just, I wanted it to be un, not, not so emotional 
you know, like the ballads and stuff. Mm-hmm. I wanted it to just be more like you're getting on the mic and you're just singing it as hard as you can sing it. Yeah. Uh, and I just thought of other vocalists that, like, if they wanted to, you know, there, there's some meat on it, you know, mm-hmm. for a singer, there's some meat on it to sing. There's some pockets to get into. Yeah. And that was the main thing I wanted from the first one, really, was it was it for it to be different to what I'd done before and to push the boundaries of what people perceive me as a little yeah. bit. Um, and then the second one was more straight down the line, sort of me trying to write a sort of, I don't know, classic sort of soul mixed with like a, a pop chorus, I guess. Yeah, it's a bit more straight straight down the line, but I really like the way that the verse works yeah. and into the chorus. And I, and I think that the BVs that I put on make it feel really soulful. Yeah, um, it's a special. I really like what you what you say about the transition from going to the from the verse to the chorus. That really is like wow, oh, something's yeah. happening. You know, that yeah. wraps your attention. I wanted to feel old school and yeah. sort of reminiscent of those songs I loved when I was growing up. It reminds me slightly of like a Lauren Hill mm. mixed with sort of some Motown yeah. mixed with maybe like a I don't know a bit of Paul Weller or something. I don't oh, know. Yeah. I can't really. I just tried to picture something summery mm. that felt upbeat that was sort of a play on play on 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 words not too serious yeah you know just something to listen to that sounds nice you know yeah. uh, not really putting my life into the song but no. equally i agree with what it's saying <laughs> not every song has to be like from the depths of your despair yeah that's or it and that and that's kind of what i've had to learn i think i've always wanted to write those soul Gut wrenching songs that are like, I don't know, that when you're at the last part of your, you know, your wheels giving out and life's getting too hard and you need a bit of respite, I always want my songs to be that. Yeah. You know, and the trouble is, nobody really likes listening to songs like that unless they're miserable. Exactly. (laughs) So, uh, you get a lot of miserable people in the audience. I think people think I'm more miserable than I am. Yeah. Um, But yeah, I'm learning. I'm learning to try and have fun with it as well. You know, like as much as the gut wrenching emotional stuff, I want stuff that feels good to listen to, that makes you want to dance and makes you want to sing from a from an entertainment feeling good point of view, rather than just all about the emotions. You know, I've got a lot of balance uh, of emotions. So yeah, but is it also maybe something uh, I feel that myself too as a songwriter, like due to COVID and everything that's happening, like, I'm done with all the the, 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 the bad stuff. I want to dance. I want to make yeah, that's dance. It. You know? Yeah. It's Bring either, some happiness. I, I either want to write stuff that's got an emotional pull on it. I want it to be more rocky sounding. Yeah. Uh, than, than sweet and sort of emotional. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how to get to that point. And that's what I want to do is make, is push it so it's a bit more gritty. Hmm. Um, I'm just trying to find a way in lyrically. For me, I'm a lyricist. I always think of the lyric. Yeah. So if it's rocky, it's got to have a lyric that sort of stands next to that. But I'm just enjoying playing with stuff, you know? Like, I was only 21 when I first started, and I feel like I'm only just getting going with my songwriting chops Hmm. now. Um, You know, I was just, I was sort of, I was given an opportunity and I wanted to I wanted to do the best with that I could do and I wasn't uh, confident enough to push for what I wanted to do. So yeah. I guess there's some of the stuff in my career that I'm a bit like, mm, you know, it is what it is. It's like, you know, it's romantic ballad stuff, I guess. It's put into that box. Yeah. Uh, but when it counts, those songs are there for people in their life. Yeah. And I'm proud of that. You know, even though they're just silly little pop songs, uh, some of them are deeper than that for people. And and I've felt that across the years. And that's what's made me feel good about my my own mistakes or my own journey yeah. as a songwriter is to sort of feel like I'm growing with them. I'm, I'm sort of, I'm learning on the job. Yeah. Well, you've got an amazing catalog, I must say. I'm a little bit jealous uh, about your catalog. Yeah, <laughs> I must say. Um, let's talk about guitars because this is uh, yeah. the podcast about guitars and the people who yeah. play uh, play on the guitars. Um, so I want to go back in time first um, to the moment you first discovered 
the guitar and music in general, maybe. Uh, can you take us back to that that yeah, specific yeah, moment? Yeah, there was like a few moments in my in my life. Um, first time I ever got a guitar, I was five. Uh, and my mum bought it me, and I used to try and play it. And my sister was like, you're rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> She'd be like, stop, you're never going to be good. You're rubbish. Um, <laughs> and then and I got so mad, I just I just smashed the crap out of the guitar oh, wow. on the chair. Like, I lost it. Yeah. Totally lost it and just smashed it to bits. And then I didn't get another guitar till I was, like, 10. Um, and I, all I could play really was like one string, one string sort of bass lines. Like I think it was Summertime, oh. Summertime Blues by Eddie Cochran. You know, like. Yeah. That's what I learned. Was that the and thing then your, uncle, was, your uncle taught you? Well, that was my mate. He was actually, my mate couldn't really play guitar, but he learned that. And I was really jealous that he could play something on the guitar and I couldn't. So I was like, can you teach it me? And then he taught it me. And then I, and then I just carried on trying to learn stuff and he didn't. He just sort of stayed with that. Yeah. And I was like, I need to learn more stuff. So I started like, you know, learning a few more baseline things um, like Billie Jean. I, I remember trying to work out Billie Jean, but then, then it, it, I got, yeah, my uncle showed me some chords for the first time. And that was when everything changed for me mm. as a, as a player or a songwriter or someone trying to learn music. It was mainly because there's so many chords in House of the Rising Sun. Yeah. There's oh, like yeah. six chords at least, isn't there? Why? And so uh, with all them chords, I just thought there's so many songs I could play with these chords. Um, and then I started going on a quest to find out how many songs I could play with these chords. And there was loads. There was so many. There was so many. Yeah. Like there's so many songs anyway with just four chords. But I, then it just started my addiction to sort of trying to learn how many songs I could play on guitar. And uh, and it was when I got to the sort of I got to the Beatles uh, back catalogue in in a book with guitar tabs, yeah. and Stevie Wonder had one out, and I got both of them, and I, and I I sat and tried to learn all those songs, and a lot of them I didn't actually know, um, some of the Beatles stuff I didn't know, but then I'd hear the melody, I'd look at the notations in the book, yeah, and see where the melody was going because I can't read music like the the tablature. Um, Yeah, and I'd look at the sort of notes because they have piano music as well as the guitar and I'd yeah. look at the notes and sort of hum out the melody and then I'd figure out, oh, actually, I think I've heard that. And so I learned to sing a lot from not knowing what I was singing. Um, and so, yeah. Oh, oh right. sorry. Someone's trying to phone me. <laughs> yeah, so um, what was he saying? Uh, that you were trying yeah, to play all these songs. Music. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, the, the way I learned to sing was from not really knowing the songs um, and just trying to ad lib yeah. and learning on the learning on the go was a lot of how I learned how to sing. You know, open mic nights. I just I just used to try and you know I get thrown in requests that I wouldn't. I'd know a little bit of the song, but not yeah. all of it. And so that was kind of how I learned how to deal with being put on the spot in terms of performing. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I just had lip round it. But like, that's fine. I'd sing this first verse again, you know. And that was kind of where I did my apprenticeship, really, was in open mic bars in my room, <laughs> <laughs> just playing in my room for years, open mic bars, busking. Yeah. I used to go busking to build my confidence and earn some money. But that is like, then, ooh, man, yeah. that is some serious shit busking. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, yeah. yeah. It yeah really especially just, when you're a kid. yeah. People just walk on by like, okay. And and if and, and it's quite brutal, you know, like yeah. if they don't want to listen, they don't listen. And, and I kind of liked that about it. It just sort of taught me how to enjoy it regardless of whether people are yeah. massively into it or not. You know, like music was always my thing for me. You know, I never thought I'd be doing it to play for other people. It was just more like... It was my little thing yeah. that I liked to do on my own, you know, um, and then it became what it is now, just from me doing that. Um, yeah. 
but you were always like playing by yourself. What was there a point that you uh, were in a band or wanted to be in a band or? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like when I was 15, I, I joined a band at my school. They had a, they had a little school band, um, and the singer, this girl, she was really good actually. But I always remember thinking, hmm, I could sing better than her. <laughs> and it was that's what started. That was where the seed sort of started, really, was at school. And I remember thinking I could probably sing at assembly, but I just found it excruciatingly embarrassing. So I didn't really say anything to the music teacher for a few years um, until I had to help a friend with our assignment and she needed a singer. Yeah. And so I went down into the music room with her. Uh, and it was Hey Jude, I think she was doing. And so I had to sing. And then the music teacher came in and she was like, how long have you been singing like that? And I was like, I'm, I don't know. It was just like, <laughs> that's what I did. Yeah. <laughs> she this she was like, yeah. you need to join the, the school band <laughs> like now. Um, and then so I start, I joined the school band. And, and then from the school band, we, we started getting extra gigs outside of school, like, We were doing the assemblies just for a laugh, really, just to keep playing. And 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 then it moved out of school into the pubs. Yeah. And we were doing like five gigs a week in the summer as a school band, like 16-year-olds. Um, oh. And it got to the point even where we get to the school on Monday and all the teachers and students would be like, nice gig, man, nice gig. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then sort of after that, you know, a few years of playing in the school band, I realised that I needed to move from yeah. Cornwall to make my music work. And that was the first thing I did. I was like, guys, I need to leave the band. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm moving to London. Um, I'm moving up the up country. Uh, and that was the end of that. Really. Did you already have then, like, did you already have like, like people in, in London you knew or you, you got to know? So you were like, okay, this is probably the path I'm gonna follow. Not or? really. No, I didn't. I, I mean, actually, I say London, it wasn't London, it was Derby first. Derby. I moved from Cornwall to Derby, where my girlfriend's from, which is like a working town. Hmm. You know, uh, people that have proper jobs. You know, they like they're mechanic or not a musician. You know, they're not musicians, no. Like people used to take the piss out of me for playing my guitar at lunchtime. They'd be like, they call me Coldplay because I look like Chris Myers. <laughs> they're like, oi, Coldplay, what you do it playing your guitar? And I was like, I'm just playing my guitar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I realized then that like, I probably wasn't in the right place. Um, but then I quit my job. Well, actually, I got fired. I got fired <laughs> Always from a my van story. cleaning Always. job. Um, and then so I used that as the opportunity. I was like, right, if I don't do music now, then I'm never going to do it. Yeah. And so I started doing open mic bars and sussing out where I could play live and getting on a little circuit in Derby. Yeah. And then uh, I was lucky enough to meet this guy, Kev Andrews, plays really good, guitar, amazing guitarist. One of the best I've ever played with. He's cool. He's really good. Uh, he can play Bohemian Rhapsody just on an acoustic. Serious? All the way through. Oh, wow. Like the solo and everything. He's, oh. he's amazing. And so I started developing with him. And then I got a record deal from between like 19 and 2020. I think I got a record deal then. Um, and then I was spent another year developing and writing. And, yeah. uh, and then after that, we just put the album out. And, and then... And, the, and then the rest is history, really. Did you already have had the, the record deal before working on the songs? Or was it like you signed a record deal, started working on the songs, and then released the album? I was like, yeah, I was already writing quite a lot. I've been writing for about a year. Um, and then the record companies got interested. I already had a lot of the songs, actually. Yeah. I already had Wonderful World, You Give Me Something, wow. Undiscovered. <laughs> I had The Pieces Don't Fit. Uh, I had called the police. I had a lot of those songs already. I had How Come, Under the Influence. There was a lot of them there. Like, um, and it was only when we had like six or seven, like with the tunes that are on there, that the label were like, look, let's just go to, let's just get this album recorded. Let's yeah. just do it. And that was when I got excited because until you record, you're in a development deal still. Hmm. So I, I just wanted to make sure I got a proper record deal and I was going to do it properly. Because uh, I had nothing to lose. No. 
you know, I, I, I wasn't looking for a record deal. And I thought, well, if they're going to want me to have a record deal and want me to do it, I want to do it properly. I want to make sure I look after myself, yeah. make sure I get a good deal. I don't get ripped off. Yeah. Um, and Especially so, yeah, I was with lucky. these songs, man, it's like... But even then, yeah. I didn't really know. I didn't know. Now you don't know what, a... what the worth is of, uh, what the songs are worth until right. they... That's it. And actually, a lot of songs, there's a lot of songs that are really good songs. But until you've heard them 200 times, yeah. they sound just like any other song, you know? Like, a part, part of the, the, the reason why songs are hits is because they're played again and again and again, yeah. you know, and you get to know them and you get to sort of, they're part of your life. Um, so at that point, they were just good songs. They weren't, to me, I didn't know that they were going to do so well. I still felt like I was on my development album. I didn't feel like this is the first album I'm putting out. I just thought this is like a beginning sort of start of my career. And maybe when I get to the third one, I'll be ready to be like a proper artist. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then I just got thrown into it. And so I was just rolling with the punches as they came. You know, I didn't really know what I was doing. I tried to keep it soulful, but not just soul music. Yeah. Um, I just, I wanted it to be have a bit of everything to it so that, that, that it gave me room to go down different routes when yeah. the time was right. Let's go back in time a little bit. The first time you got yourself a proper guitar. Can you remember that um, moment? Yeah, I do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, the, all these little things, like, they never go away, really. Yeah. Um, my first nice guitar was an Ovation, uh, and it was a round back. With, with a rounded back, yeah. Oh, they're a nightmare. Uh, yeah. They're, like, they're, they're a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what, I just, I remember playing an Ovation, and I thought it was the nicest guitar I'd ever heard at that time. <laughs> You yeah. know, I was I was still playing Tanglewoods. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> which are good. You know, um, but yeah, that was the first time I'd ever uh, sort of played a guitar that was more than uh, like two hundred quid. Yeah, um, and I remember my mate's one had a hole in it, and so the resonation was quite buzzy and trebly, and that's why I liked it. Yeah, you know, uh, and then when I got mine it just sounded all new and clean. And I was like, this isn't right. And it was really uncomfortable to sit with because it just slide off. It slides off you. In the, yeah. It's so annoying. Yeah. Um, and so I had that for a few years and then, and then I, I realized I needed another guitar because it was doing my head in. So I gave that to my brother and then I got myself a, I think. Yeah, you have the shitty guitar. <laughs> yeah. I gave him the shit, but he still got it. He oh, yeah. still got it. And it's, and then the front was blue and now it's green because it's so old oh, yeah. and it's sat in the sun. It's gone green, but he's still got that guitar. You know, he's still That's got cool. it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'd say like the first time I ever got a guitar that I was like, Oh, this is nice. Uh, was the Gibson Hummingbird. Is that, that the I, one you played on uh, You Give Me Something in, in the New York yeah. video? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that was an old one. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's an old... Yeah, that's right. It's, I think it was a Sunburst one. Yeah. Uh, I ended up actually giving that guitar away to this lad. Oh, wow. Um, he was just learning guitar, and he was a big fan. And he was, and he was. I said to him, mate, just practice every day. And just do it because you love it. And I yeah. said all this stuff to him when I was pissed. And I completely forgot about what I said. And months later, he came back round to this person's house that I was staying at. And he's like, oh, I just want to show you what I've been practicing. And he played Tears in Heaven by Eric Clapton. Yeah. He played um, Fast Car by Tracy Chapman. He played a few things that were like, oh. Like you've been practicing, wow. uh, and I thought, and I was so impressed with how is how he, he went at it and tried to learn that I ended up. I brought that guitar and I signed it for him, and I said, "Mate, I got you a present here." And he was like, "What is it?" And I was like, um, "It's a guitar," and I said, "It's the guitar that I used in You Give Me and Wonderful World in the videos." I said, yeah. "It's yours, mate," and I gave it to him like that, and he was like. He just couldn't believe it. Yeah. But he still got it. He still got it, bless him. Cool. And he and he, he he is someone who who really wants to do it. And that's why I gave it to him. Because I just thought it would be a nice little reminder for him to keep going, to keep yeah. trucking on, keep trying. 
Um, but yeah, I've got loads of nice guitars than that one now. That one was all right. Yeah. I mean, this one. Oh, whoa, oh, oh, this, oh, this going to, let, 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 I've got a, let me, let me see. Uh, this one, let me see. The favorite guitar of James Morrison. It is, it's one of them. It's I've one of them. Oh, a nice wow. little dub on it. Yeah. It's a Gibson. It just sounds lovely. It's just got a nice action. It's not in tune, though. No. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I've got quite a few. I've got a Western, actually. Is that um, is that the one you, you've been playing on the acoustic version of uh, You Give Me Something, I think? Um, I'm not the, sure. The, the new actually. one. I've got quite one. a few. The new one is my one that's got um, all the little inlays in the... Uh, oh, yeah. That's an Avalon guitar. That's Avalon. They used to do... They used to be called Louder. Oh, yeah. An Irish, Irish guitar. They're amazing. They're, they're some of the nicest guitars you'll ever play. I just think they're, they're made now, now beautiful. called Avalon. Av they're called Loudon now. Yeah, Loudon. Yeah, but they did. Tur they turned from uh, Loudon to Avalon, uh -huh. um, and then the son of George Loudon, I think his name is, he started the company up again and went back to Loudon. Uh -huh. So they're Loudon again now. But okay. um, I, I, I got mine when they were Avalon. Oh, right. um, but they're just nice, sturdy working guitars that stay crisp. Yeah. They've got a crisp sort of attack when you hit them. And I'm not really like a massive plectrum player. No. So I need to be able to tap it and sort of get a rhythm as well as strum the strings. Yeah. So it's perfect for me for that, really. It really has to work with you, like the way you play, you know? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, I remember. And I never got on with like jumbo, you know those no. big jumbo guitars. I never, they were too bottom endy for yeah. my voice, really. So I need something crisp because yeah. my voice is is husky. I need something crisp that yeah. cuts through all that. Yeah, exactly. Like it, it, if it's low end, it's got to be tight low end. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I understand, I understand. And with the the inlays, because uh, I, I saw that guitar on, on YouTube. Um, it was it the same guitar you played on the acoustic version of Slave to the Music, maybe? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I've had that guitar a long time, you know, probably 10 years, 12 years. Um, and I've been using it on tour for years, so it's, it's just played in, yeah, it's just properly played in. Um, and it's just good for anything, really. I can use it for acoustic. Um, recordings. I can use it for studio. I can use it for live. So it's just a real good workhorse. Yeah, that's the thing. You need a guitar. I have the, the same uh, like uh, struggle with guitars. I want mm. a guitar which is good for picking, which is good for mm. strumming, uh, which is good for like playing with the fingers. And, and you want to be able to do everything. Yeah, on yeah. And that, it's difficult to find. I must say because when I go to like this these expensive guitar shops. Uh, and spend way too much money on guitars. I always pick one which is really good at strumming, or yeah, yeah, yeah. finger picking. Like yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know that's the thing. Sometimes a cheap guitar yeah is is what you need. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, like I've found yeah. real shitty guitars in sort of uh, car boot sales. You know, oh, yeah. like Spanish Spanish strung guitars at, at car boot sales. I found a Brazilian 1870. Spanish guitar for fiver. Wow. <laughs> and the guy didn't even know. He was like, yeah, it's a fiver, mate. And I was like, all right. <laughs> it had all paint all over it, but yeah. it was a it's, it's still, I've still got it. It's still a really beautiful guitar. It needs restringing, but it, I, I like sort of finding little, you know, little gems. Do you also uh, search like uh, reverb.com and all the, those sorts of things? No, not really. eBay. I should. I should, you know, I've probably, I'm not, I'm not a guitar virtuoso, so I don't really feel like I deserve to have those sort of high end, yeah, you yeah. know, Fender Strat. Yeah. I'd love a Fender Strat. Um, I've never had one, but I have got some nice, I've got a really nice telly. Yeah. A 1972 Telecaster. Wow. And I've got um, a 1963 ES3330. Do you have it there exactly. somewhere close? Yeah, yeah. Show us. <laughs> This is what it looks like. Oh, wow. That is sweet. Beast. 
it sounds so good when you plug it in. Yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. like, bah, 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 bah. Yeah. it's just so good. It, 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 it's, it's one of those that I, I, need to, I need to do some writing with it because I know that I'll come up with something pretty good. It's yeah. just got a dirty sound. It just sounds like old school soul and blues when mm. you play it. Um, yeah. But I love it for that. But yeah, I really I've got believe, a few different things. I really believe that guitars have songs in them that need to... You need yeah, to and it's like there's it. certain areas on the guitar where you can feel they've played. Yeah. You know, like up here, I can feel like he must have been a jazz guitarist because there's oh, yeah. loads of little bits up here that like feel really smooth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the transitions into the notes, you can feel that they've used them quite a lot. And I love that about instruments, the yeah. sort of the history that's locked into it. Yeah. You know, like I've got I've got one here somewhere. I don't know. What, I don't know where it is actually. I've got it might be in its case. I've got one that was made out of like dead wood, uh, dead redwood that was pulled out of the Mississippi <laughs> and dried out. Yeah. And then they use it to make guitars and they made it's a it's 1938 uh, wow. blues. I think it's called Melody Blues or something. Oh, yeah. But the only picture of it I've ever seen, it's got a white neck all the way up on the inlays is all white oh, cool. and then the body's dark brown and it the only picture I've ever seen of it on, on online is the one that I've got um, and that was from like rare and vintage guitars they do like like a quite, small parlor guitar body maybe yeah small yeah, yeah. it's like um like, like a, a like a, almost like a mine yeah you know like an old school mine yeah um Yeah, like, but like it's a, just such a, and I write on that a lot. Actually, oh, yeah. it's one of my favorite guitars to sort of write on because it's got like, like I was saying, that crispness, mm. and you can sort of just tinker away, and it just feels nice, like a Robert Johnson uh, guitar. Yeah, it looks like that. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, it looks like that. Yeah, it's like there's no frills. There's loads of scratches on it, and it looks rough. But I, when I play it, I feel the history in it, and yeah. I love that. Straight out of the Mississippi Delta. I should be better than I am uh, <laughs> to own a guitar like that, but um, it's actually made my playing better because yeah. I want to play it. That's you the know. thing. If a guitar is like, it feels good, you you need to play it, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. And I have that with guitars. I either like them or I don't. And I don't know what it is that makes me like them other than it being crisp. Yeah, it sort of has a, a nice ring to it, and I don't know. It's like a, it's like it's like girls, I guess. You know, if you yeah, go out on yeah. a date and 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 it's not going so well, and you're like, I'm not saying stuff that not we're not clicking. It's the same with guitars. It's like you either go, oh, this is good, or yeah. you're like, oh. you know. And any time I go guitar shopping, it's 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 as intimidating as it is oh, exciting. Man. Yeah, you know. Um, but I, yeah, like going to America in the guitar shops, those big guitar shops and there's loads of people shredding and, uh, and I'm like, I don't know, really know what to yeah. play now I'm here. They're like, do you play? You play me? I'm like, yeah. yeah. And, and I don't know what to do. Oh man, that's always a struggle in a guitar shop. It's like, okay. yeah. Right. As long as you don't yeah. play Stairway to Heaven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no Stairway. Denied. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh man, I feel you. I feel you. It's always intimidating to go to, to these music shops. It's yeah, uh, it's always even when too you expensive. even when you play. Yeah. Unless you're a virtuoso and you can go in there. Yeah. Uh, even then it's quite difficult to get people's yeah. attention sometimes. You know, do you I have think like, you have to just do you have like a a, a a standard thing you play when when picking up a new guitar, like some some standard um, noodling? Oh, Um, not, I mean, not really. It's like, I just sort of dick about. I just sort of... Yeah, just... I normally just go like... I just yeah, try, I just stick yeah, yeah. about playing little things, you know, like I'll play a bit of reggae just to to hear the intonations. Yeah. Or uh, whatever, you know, just little things to get a vibe, really. Yeah. Just to sort of, I'll do some, you know, sometimes I play that John Martin song, uh, May You Never. Oh, yeah. It's so out of tune. Yeah. <laughs> 
we yeah. will, we will you tune know, in just, in post Just stuff that I, I feel like I would play when I'm on my own. Yeah. Um, you know, just sort of a little bit of picking and a little bit of just sort of playing stuff that I know I play quite a lot. And do you uh, also so sing can, sing when you're when you're uh, testing out a new guitar? Uh, a little bit. Yeah. If it's quiet in the shop, yeah, then yeah. I'll have a little slight. I won't sing loud though. Because we're, it's not about me showing off. It's no. not about me showcasing like, yeah, I can sing. It's more <laughs> like I just want to try seeing what it sounds like with me exactly. in a quiet little space, you know. If it works, if the, the vocal works together with the guitar, it's, it's really important. Yeah. But I have the same and that's how I've hesitation, you know. Yeah. It's just listening, sitting there, listening, playing and going, oh, I like that or I don't, you know. Yeah. It works for my voice or it doesn't. And a lot of the time, the ones with the crispy sort of, nice high-end sort of brightness yeah. to the strings um, just allows me to sort of sing yeah. over that. Yeah, I have the same experience because I also have a little bit of a raspy voice. So when, when I pick a guitar, it's like medium, not the jumbo ones because it's, yeah, it's, that's too, right. it's yeah. like too big, you know? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The last bit, and then we have to... Uh, wrap it up for next uh, the next interview you have. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Uh, this is about gear. Are you a bit of a gear nerd? Um, not really, actually. I think I started my whole career with no pedals at all. I still don't really use that many pedals. I feel like I probably should. Yeah. <laughs> like loads of people use pedals for loads of different stuff. Yeah. But I've only ever really used my voice and my guitar. Like, I've only ever had a tuner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know. It's, it's only when I started setting up my home studio, yeah. I put a little pedal board together. Um, and it's just got stuff like, it's got like a harmonizer pedal. Oh, yeah. Um, so that if I'm writing tunes, I can sing and it's got all the chorus sort of harmonies there. That's really handy for writing. I love it. Yeah, um, oh, that's cool. The TC Helicon, I think it's cool. Oh, yeah. The TC Helicon Live. It's quite good. I've got a few loop pedals. Um, that's kind of it. I've got a carbon filter thing okay. for yeah. delay and echo and stuff. That's nice. But I've just collected bits off my band, really. Like, yeah. I spoke to my guitar player and, it, and I said, tell me what the best pedals are, you know, for reverb or for, like, a slight bit of grit. And he just basically just told me all the pedals to get uh and there's some i've got some of those electro electronic harmonics electro harmonics yeah yeah and i've got, I've got like a one that turns your guitar into an organ that's oh, yeah. pretty good yeah 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 I'm, I'm not for demos for yeah. writing de for, for, it's mainly for writing demos yeah um but on stage i still don't really use pedals and let, until i go to an electric guitar i don't think i really use pedals like um, I use different guitars for different things. You know, yeah. I've got a Spanish guitar that I use for person I should have been. It's more Spanishy, mm. and I've got a twelve-string that I use for the Awakening, which is a bit more sort of rocky, sort of American radio sounding. And and I use my acoustic for everything else. Yeah. So it's even just like getting a different guitar was a massive thing for me in the beginning. Um, I, I don't yeah. know why, um, but I suppose I've tried to limit the amount of pedals and extra things I need to make me sound like me. Yeah. You know, um, I just try and, you know, get, if the vocal sounds nice and the guitar's mic'd right and it's, and then it sounds good, just like a, a guitar and vocal. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of, I'm just quite sort of not purist, um, but, That's just the way I've learned yeah. how to how to go on stage. So yeah, I don't really use that many pedals. No, I understand. I understand totally. Uh, we're going. Uh, we're going quickly to the last bit, and that's a really, really fast uh, thing. The dilemmas. I'm going to ask you a question, and uh, you have to choose. Okay, your okay. house. Your house is on fire. Your children yeah. and your, your girlfriend are safe. You have one chance to go back. You're running through this burning hallway, and there, at the end of the hallway, ha, is one guitar you can take with you. What is that guitar? Oh, that's tough. That is tough because I love all of them. Oh, God. I think I'd probably say this one. 
because it's just there's something about it. Yeah, it's got a spirit of its own. It just, it's just got a, a feeling about it when yeah. you play it that, that I don't really get from any of the other guitars. Like maybe it's because I can't play lead like Jimi Hendrix, like <laughs> I want it. Or John but Mayer. The potential <laughs> of being able to is yeah. is more significant when I'm holding this guitar. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. Okay, uh, on to the next one. A cheap amp with an expensive guitar or a uh, expensive amp and a cheap guitar? I'd say, oh, that's difficult uh, because I've had a shit amp and it really is not good. Um, and if you get a real nice, like, twin reverb silver thing, one of those Fender amps, yeah. they sound amazing. You can get, I'd say, a cheap guitar with a really good amp. Good call. Because the amp will sort of make it sound solid. Finger picking or strumming? Um, I'd say finger picking. It's more interesting. It's more fun as well. Okay. I've never really liked strummy, strummy, strum. No. I think that's why I always put beats into my... Yeah. I always try and put beat in there. I understand, um, yeah. That's because I don't like the strummy strum. Okay. Um, on your electric guitar, uh, 010 or 011 strings on it? I, I go heavier than that, actually. Seriously? I even go to. I used to play thirteen. Wow, you used to even play on you because I was I was snapping all the strings all the oh, time. Yeah. I wouldn't I, I, on an acoustic. I'd probably go eleven or, or heavier. Okay, because yeah. they just sound a bit less twangy. You know, true. Uh, phosphor bronze or elixirs on your acoustic? Uh, I think I use phosphor bronzes now. Um, I used to use the Alexias. Uh, I can't remember why I stopped using them. I think the coating um, did my head in a little bit. I think some of the bronze ones, when they take in a little bit of your sweat, yeah, they sound good. Yeah. But it's obviously like if you sweat on them too much too and much, they get coated in it, then dull. it's not good. Yeah, yeah, they go dull. But yeah. I, I, yeah, I like the, um, I like the, I like the phosphorus ones best. They're, they're good. Okay, and the last question: nails on your right hand, short or long? I am sure. <laughs> I just find long fingernails on guitar players creepy. Yeah. I just... Um, yeah. But oh, some of the best people who play guitar have long fingernails. Yeah. Um, it's a yeah, style. It's my, a style. I just don't... I just... I've had longer fingernails on this hand before and they normally just catch on the strings and snap. So it's not good. You can rip your whole nail off. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I keep mine short. Okay. Noted. Okay, uh, I think we uh, we we've reached the end of this, uh, of this podcast. Answer. Yeah. Uh, let fun. me see. Let me see. I'm gonna stop this music. Thank you all for listening to uh, Guitar Man on the podcast, Mr. James Morrison. Thanks for being oh, thank my you, guest. Sir. It's been a pleasure. Uh, your greatest hits album will be out February 11th, and you're also yeah. coming to Holland and Belgium. For some shows this spring, um, 28th of April in uh, the Melkweg, Milky Way in Amsterdam, the 2nd of nice. May, Tivoli, Vredeburg, Utrecht, and the 5th of May you'll be uh, playing uh, in Belgium in Tricks in yeah. Antwerp. Can't That's wait. Nice. I love the, I love playing Europe. So yeah, keep oh, yeah, coming man. back. I appreciate it. Keep on coming to us, and we will come to you. <laughs> uh, and thank you, Ben. <laughs> Uh, and for all the people listening, make sure to subscribe to the podcast. Uh, sub yeah. Subscribe to my YouTube channel, at Um And leave a review somewhere. I don't care where, but just do it. Uh, oh, and don't forget to tell all your friends that this is the best guitar podcast ever. Even if it ain't <laughs> yeah. so. Yeah. I'd agree with that. All right. And if James says so, it's true, people. <laughs> <laughs>